Hello and welcome to another episode of the Uranium Market Minute. Today is Wednesday, July 13th. This is episode number 152. My name is Justin Hewn. I am your host. I'm the founder and publisher of the Uranium Insider Pro Newsletter, the only investing newsletter that focuses solely on uranium and publishes on a regular monthly basis. As always, nothing that you see or hear in this podcast is intended to be investing advice. I'm not your financial advisor. This is not financial advice. Please always do your own due diligence when it comes to investing and always take responsibility for your own choices. All right, good to be back here again with you guys today. Um, had a very interesting day in the market. Uh, the market opened just gapping down on uh, higher than expected inflation numbers and with the CPI numbers, the PPI numbers coming tomorrow. Um, and then the market kind of clawed itself back throughout the day. Most uranium stocks actually ended up in the green today, which was nice to see a slight outperformance of the broad market on a relatively volatile day. We'll look at the charts in just a moment. But before we do that, let's go ahead and jump right into the daily scoreboard here. Spot price of uranium trick it, trickling down again slightly, 46.50 a pound mid-market. Um, really interesting to see the spot price holding up okay, all things considered, with uh, a quiet time, season, seasonally speaking, a typically quiet time, and with spot trading at a consistent, very large discount to NAV. In fact, yesterday, it closed at a minus 16.15% discount to NAV. This really isn't a great look for the spot vehicle. Um, I think that there's a lot, uh, a lot of folks in the market that would appreciate uh, the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust actually um, going for that non-course issuer bid and uh, buying back units with some of the cash that they have now. Do they have enough cash to bring them all the way back to you know trading at NAV? Probably not. But given the fact that they do still, and they are still sitting on sixty million dollars in cash, buying trust units at a sixteen percent discount to NAV is certainly more creative to shareholders than buying more uranium, which honestly, I'm, I'm glad that they're not buying uranium when they're trading at this big of a discount to NAV and they still have some cash. So possibly they're working on that. I would really like to see them do that. Even if they can't move all the way back to getting them close to their net asset value, at the very least, I think it would be a strong message to the market that, hey, this vehicle, uh, this product does have this in uh, in the tool in the tool shed here, we we can use other tools besides just buying uranium. We can buy trust units back if the discount to NAV persists. Um, with that said, it's also highly likely that the guys at these at uh, at Sprott, basically, especially Mr. Chimpaglia and other folks that are working with him on this vehicle, they know more than we do, and they are in conversations constantly with very very high net worth investors, um, institutional investors. So um, I'm sure that they understand that this moment in time is temporary. And when risk is back on, uh, they fully expect this product to trade back at NAV and ideally at a slight premium on occasion, allowing them to raise more cash, buy more uranium. Uh, I think that that is actually probably the case. I do believe that institutional investors that are aware of this product are aware of the mechanism of this product and are likely to go after this product when they want to put money to work again. Okay, um, let's see. The two ETFs, URA and URNM, both reported no changes in outstanding shares. Not a lot of uh, funds flowing uh, at the very moment. And when we do see volatility over the past few months, that tended to be to the downside. And so we have seen more redemptions than we have share issuance. With that said, URNM has barely changed their outstanding share count over the last couple of months of risk off. URA significantly more so probably due to increased volatility, likely influenced by the options activity that is far greater um, and a far deeper options market for URA than there is URNM. Okay, let's look at the charts. I have a very interesting chart to show you guys that really, really starkly points to the underperformance of the equities of late. Okay, so when I've done this, uh, this relative charting in the past of the miners relative to the metal, I have chosen to use the Sprott vehicle, the Sput, uh, the Sput vehicle as the quote unquote metal. But now that that's trading at a significant discount to NAV, I prefer to actually go towards the uh, UX1, which is basically the uranium futures price. And there isn't much of a uranium futures market. So this really is kind of the price of uranium. This UX1, excuse me, let's see. Uh, continuous current contract in front, uh, 46.45. That's pretty close. We're actually right at 46. 
Um, but either way, it's closer than, than it would be if you were to look at the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust because it's trading at a 16% discount to NAV. And now we see the SPUD Trust today was quite weak and the equities were up one, two, three percent So, uh, and, and the SPUD Trust was actually down today. So that we actually saw a big bump up in that overperformance. But in my opinion, if we look at URA relative to the... Uh, the front contract, the front month contract on uranium futures. Look at this level that we're sitting at here. The price of the equities, AKA URA, is at levels right now that they were back in November of 2020. This is before the bull market started. This is crazy. So when you look at the equities valuations relative to the actual price of the commodity. We are back at pre-bull market levels. And you might say, Justin, some of these equities have doubled, tripled, quadrupled since that level. And yes, that is true. But if you look at things on a relative basis compared to where the metal is, um, we are back at pre-bull market levels for the equities. That's insane. And this actually uh, speaks a lot towards what I've spoken about in the past couple of weeks, which is the, uh, the, the smart guys, and, and I don't want to say, I'm not trying to say that there's smart, smart people and dumb people, smart money and dumb money in the sector. Um, of course there is, but what I'm trying to say is that the people that have put 10, 15, 20 plus thousand hours into this that are managing hundreds of millions of dollars in assets under management in uranium specific or uranium focused funds, these guys are getting long here. These guys are buying your shares, okay? That's what's happening here. And I hate to put it so bluntly, but um, you, you know, you'll often see kind of a, a retail panic tweet saying, who in their right mind is selling here? Who is selling? Damn it, who keeps selling? Well, every, every time you're, you, there's a seller, there's a buyer, right? You can't have, you, you can't sell to nobody here. You have to sell to somebody who's willing to buy. So who are the buyers here? That's the more important question. Who are the buyers here? And I'm telling you, the buyers are the people that have uh, the confidence that comes from many thousands of hours of research, the confidence that comes from understanding what's happening in the fuel cycle, understanding what's coming in the fuel cycle. And we are going to really drill into that, what's happening and what's coming in the fuel cycle in the webinar next week. That is a week from tomorrow. That is July 21st. I've mentioned that the last couple of market minutes, I want to re-emphasize that because this is the most important thing to understand is knowing what's what's happening currently. Because if you just look at the screen, if you look at uh, Numerico on Twitter and you see the spot price down a couple of pennies or maybe a dollar here, 50 cents there, you see the spot vehicle trading at a big discount to NAV. Um, you see, okay, the things are just really quiet and boring in this space right now, but you've got to understand what's happening behind the curtain. And that's really what we're going to dive deeply into. And I've talked about this to the extent that I'm able and willing to do so on this free podcast, but, um, we are going to really, really see how the sausage is made next week. And that's something I'm very much looking forward to. So long story short, people who are selling here, who is buying the bu people who are buying are, are back. We're back to this being a contrarian investment again. This is a belief in the fundamentals, a belief in where the market is going to go eventually, and a trust in that um, and understanding that we've pulled way back in terms of valuations for these things. And yes, the spot price has fallen from the price that it peaked out at. That is true, but we are way up in the spot price before the beginning of the bull market. In fact, we're up about 50%. Um, slightly more than 50% when the bull market started, okay? We're talking about December, 2020. The bull market did not start in March, 2020, okay? The equities bottomed out because of a risk-off event that was a complete anomaly. That was an exogenous event that had nothing to do with the fundamentals of uranium. That's not when the bull market started. Now, that led to, um, you know, a Cigar Lake being pulled offline for six months. That led to Kazadam Prom not uh, doing any well field development for six months that had some knock on effects in the future, although very little for Kazadam Prom. But uh, the real uh, volume did not come into the sector in, until um, December 2020. That's when we saw the volume kick in that wasn't there before. And look how the volume has really picked up since then. So this is that kickoff moment, December 2020, when money started to flow into the sector in a new way. And really that trend has only continued. Now, money has come off a bit, 
volume has come off a bit. And when I say money has come off, that's not entirely true. We've actually seen more share issuance than we have redemptions this year to date. In fact, we've seen uh, over $500 million in mandated buying from the ETFs um, alone. But we're seeing this decline in volume as we've seen the sector pull back. Now, that's something that, uh, that I'm definitely okay with seeing. All of that is to say, to wrap that up, who is selling here? The people that are selling here are some, there's some retail capitulation. Capitulation is a pretty strong word. I don't mean that we're seeing panicked high volume selling. We aren't seeing that. We're just seeing kind of an exhaustion from, uh, from retail, in my opinion. And I'm telling you right now that I'm talking to the guys that I'm mentioning here. And um, these people are, are very bullish, they're very bullish. And they are buying the shares that, uh, that, the, that the retail capitulators are selling. Cameco did decently today, up 0.5% on the day. Um, the S&P was roughly flat. In fact, I think it closed slightly down. So we did see a little bit of outperformance here. This has been a sector leader for the most part. We're sitting right around that important area that's seen. How many times have we seen this area defended right around that $20 area? One, two, we broke down below that in January. Three, four, five, six, seven. This is an important area that's being defended currently. Will we go risk off again? Um, we will see what a surprise higher rate hike in uh, later in the month. I don't really know. But all I know is that things are looking prime. A lot of these things are looking coiled. Next gen, I like to look as another large cap in the sector that's been particularly beat down. This one, we're seeing um, continued positive divergence in the RSI. Next gen up uh, almost 1% on the day, but still we're not seeing breakout volumes anywhere across the space. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust lastly, just because um, uh, we're masochists. This, <laughs> this one broke down heavily this morning, traded back up, ended up closing only down 1% on the day, putting in what looks to me like a pretty strong bottoming hammer candle, um, though the volume, again, is just not there. And I don't think we're going to see a whole lot of volume come into this until we get at a closer to uh, uh, closer to NAV. Although, you know what, we did approach NAV on this previous run up back in May and the volume still did not come into this into this vehicle. So this, this one really speaks to risk off across the sector. Interestingly enough, this gap from September, okay? This gap from September, now we practically filled today. We were a couple of pennies from filling that gap today. Incredible. I honestly cannot believe that we are seeing these levels. And if you are deploying cash, if you're just arriving at this thesis, if you have cash to deploy, despite the fact that you are long, perhaps you've been long for a very long time. Uh, we have newsletter members that have been long uranium since Fukushima. I'm not kidding. Um, they've round tripped this thing. Uh, we've been, we, I, I know people personally that I speak with that have been long since 2015. Um, when when the sector, kind of the pundits in the sector really started to talk about it, when we started to see the companies say, oh, the, the commodity is trading like at a third of the cost of production, this has to turn around 2015, 2016. 2016 was, is when the commodity bottomed. There's a lot of people that are long since then. And uh, these are people that are very, very patient and looking for a generational wealth opportunity in this trade and uh, gun to my head, I think they're going to get it. All right, going to do a quick mailbag here. A couple of points that came in, uh, questions that came to me earlier in the day. Um, the first question has to do with a waiver. Uh, this person wants to know my take on this waiver that the Canadian government has given to CIGN, ARCC, shippers. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a shipper, a Canadian shipper that ships fissile material enriched uranium from Russia to the West. And in this case, we heard a few weeks back that the shipment had been blocked because of sanctions that Canada currently has on shipping Russian material. Uh, that shipment was blocked. Now that shipment uh, we are hearing has in fact gone through and the Canadian government has given a one year uh, waiver to those sanctions for the shipment of Russian uranium. So this, in my opinion, is a very, very interesting development, okay? And 
like I've already mentioned, th this particular situation is very relevant to what's going on in the fuel cycle. So there's going to be much discussion about this next week in, in the members webinar. But I'm going to just touch on it briefly here. I think this is a very interesting development. Why? Because up to this point, the U.S. utilities have been able to receive that enrichment uh, from, from Russia um, with, the, uh, with, with the previously agreed upon restrictions under the Russian suspension agreement, okay? So it's not kind of a free-for-all and it never has been. But to the extent that the RSA will allow, the U.S. utilities still do have contracts that are expecting deliveries coming from Russia now and out into the future. What this does now is it creates a time frame and it gives utilities, let's say in the United States, for example, an option, okay? So now they can at least say, okay, the deliveries of the enrichment that we need for the next 12 months, we can still get from this shipper. Going forward beyond that, they have two choices. One, they can try to arrange different shipping companies to allow for that enrichment to continue to be shipped, which I don't think they're going to do. And two, they can cover their needs from those, they can, they can renege on those contracts, force majeure, and they can cover their needs by seeking enrichment elsewhere. That is already happening. So it's not like, oh, they have that option now. They're already doing that. That is why we're seeing these prices. We are seeing these price spikes in uh, enrichment, in conversion. And so this, uh, this, I think, is a really important development because it puts a solid uh, time frame for the utilities to deal with and wrap their head around. It's not an unknown going out into the future how long we will be able to get this. Now they know we can get this for a year unless we find another shipper that's willing to ship physical material. I think that's more difficult than most might assume. So now they have this situation where they have a time frame to work with to go ahead and seek out that enrichment going forward. That is going to put continued pressure on overfeeding of the enrichers um of, of the enrichment facilities of the centrifuges essentially in the west big deal very big deal so um look forward to diving deeper into that next week but for now let's just say that shipment is coming the u.s utilities that need that uranium okay there's no real short-term workaround for this so in my opinion it's actually a good thing that they're giving them this allowance so that's some security for the reactors that need that fuel so that's on its way and it will be allowed to be shipped to the US, to the West, to Canada, et cetera, for the next 12 months. Okay, next. Then, uh, by the way, that was a report by RBC that put that information out there. And this is another RBC story. An RBC research report just issued a predicting a 25 million pound per year deficit through 2030. Um, so the person asking me this is saying, it was basically the question was, what do you think about those deficit numbers? Um, first of all, I think that that's probably, they're probably putting an average on, right? Because we are going to have mines come back online, assuming that the price uh, justifies it. But we do know already that Paladin raised the cash to bring Langer Heinrich back online. That's expected to come back online 2024. We know that uh, Cameco is in process of restarting MacArthur River. They announced that back in uh, February. And so, um, really what this uh, 25 million pounds per year deficit, I don't think that's calculating an expected uh, overfeeding, at least for the next few years, at least, you know, minimum we're looking at three years of overfeeding uh, in the West, unless something drastically changes where all of a sudden Russian uranium is uh, allowed to be sold back to the West. I, I don't think anybody's expecting that that's going to be the case. So, it takes multiple years to build out enrichment capacity. And in the meantime, the only way that the increased demand can be reached is through overfeeding, which is having an immediate effect on UF6 and conversion and will be having an effect on U308 and that is coming. So according to our own numbers, those numbers are light. If you were to average that out to 2030 and those numbers include an expectation of most mines that are in development or expected to be in development towards the end of the decade do in fact come online, which is a stretch. And we're still going to see significant supply deficits larger than what this RBC report put out. 
in, in our opinion. And that's uh, obviously we're going to see new projections coming from the WNA, the nuclear fuel report, and the next fuel report that comes out. You can probably include a certain amount of overfeeding demand in the high scenario of those three scenarios, the low, the reference, and the high scenario. So in my opinion, the high scenario is what is more than likely going to play out at least in the short term. And by short term, I mean, let's say short to midterm, at least in the next three to five years, I think we're going to see a much, much greater demand um, coming from the Western enrichers because of overfeeding. It's a huge swing. It's a huge inflection point. I talked about that a couple of days ago. Um, that's a really big deal. So um, either way, even if we go with the numbers from RBC, that's big, 25 million pounds a year out until 2030. That's a really, really big deficit. But um, I think that we can assume that it's even going to be greater if you consider the overfeeding demand that is happening right, right now. All right, thank you for watching. If you do enjoy these episodes, I really would appreciate you liking this video, um, subscribing to this channel. Channel. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, um, thank you for your support and for listening to me on that, those platforms. If you wanna leave me a review on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, that would go a long way to helping us out. And uh, not looking for any favors here. Realistically, what we really want to do with this channel is to do our best to inform and educate on kind of the nuances of this market and bring more people into this investment thesis. And the reasoning for that is we believe strongly that uh, we can make a lot of money on this investment. And I really want that to come to as many people as possible. Um, with the caveat that you have to be patient, you have to understand it's a volatile sector. You never want to put all your eggs in one basket, et cetera, et cetera. All of the standard classic uh, value investing tropes apply here. Um, you don't want to you don't want to put all of your eggs into this into this investment. Um, Andrew Weekly, my friend Andrew Weekly from Smith Weekly says, um, only invest in uranium what you're willing to lose. Okay, that's a place to start because it is very, very volatile. It's very risky, but we believe strongly that we're going to see immense returns with this trade in the next, uh, gosh, 12 to 36 months and possibly longer. Um, I think that this is going to make very, very strong moves. And I think that when it moves, it's going to surprise people to the upside as uranium always does, as it did when it first moved, when bull market really first started, in my opinion, December, 2020, it just took off. It left so many people in the dust and you just see uh, crazy FOMO volumes come into the sector because it's so very difficult to time the bottom for uranium in any of these intracycle pullbacks. But I feel confident in this investment. I think most of you watching this do as well. And uh, you know, we're, we're in difficult times right now. We're in a very high inflationary environment in most modern societies across the world right now. We have to, we have to get alpha. We have to get a return on our investment in order to outperform just sitting in cash. And that's really what we're trying to do here. And that's what I hope that um, the information in this channel is helping all of you to do in terms of understanding this investment thesis and when it plays out, if it plays out, which I believe that it will, um, it's going to be glorious for all of us. So thank you for watching. Thank you for your support. I will see you again tomorrow. Take care. Cheers.